Matthew chapter 24 tonight, verse number 36. Let's stand together for the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 24, verse number 36, honoring the Scriptures. Let's stand together. But of that day and hour, crucial phrase, we'll be spending a little bit of time on that tonight. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in those days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth Come, you can be seated again as a friendly reminder in case you've slept since last time we've studied this. All of this, Matthew 24, all of Matthew chapter 25 is coming from a situation and a circumstances that was spawned by the disciples asking Jesus in verse number 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And we have spent a great deal of time going through the Scriptures and going through what Jesus said in verses number 4 through 31 of this chapter. And in those verses of Scripture, Jesus, if you'll remember, He answered the question backwards. They asked when and what. He answers what and when. And so now we're in the when section. What, when is this going to take place? How, when are we going to know these things? And so Jesus pointed out that there's certain signals that we're going to be big, we're going to be given. And he talked about all of those signals, the, the birth pains, the, here it comes, the abomination of desolation found in verse number 15, the, uh, the need to run because here comes the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation. And then he says that these things are going to happen. And as he began to to move into the next section he stops them and he he he, he lets them says after he level, leveled them with okay here's the sign the sign of the second coming of christ is christ it comes at the end of the tribulation it's going to come after the world has become dark it's going to become after all the natural disasters and catastrophes have taken place on this earth the earth is going to be black and then all of a sudden out of nowhere across the eastern sky coming like lightning, is going to come a bright light, and that bright light is, guess who? It's the Son of Man. He's coming with thousands and ten thousands, Jew would say, of the saints. That's you and I. We come riding in. He sets up the millennial kingdom. And so all of these things are pressing. So after he's told them that, that was their first question, or their second question, he looks and says, now, now that you got that, he, he, he wants to say, now I want you to learn a parable. What he's just done is like taught a very deep, deep lesson from the Bible. He's taught one of those theology messages. I call them shredded wheat messages. They, they're good for you, but they're hard to swallow. Amen? It, it, sometimes we study some things and you're going, okay, Brother Rick, that's okay. And I'm just all excited and y'all are going, yeah, I can tell. This, you know, you're going... How's that going to help me tomorrow at work? Well, Jesus has told them all this, and now he's going to tell them how it's going to help them tomorrow at work. Now he comes in with some parables. That's simply an object lesson of teaching a spiritual truth using natural things. So after he's unleveled on them, these, these great, all those D's I gave you, and now he says, now here's what I want you to learn. It's like a fig tree. And he goes through, and he talks about, Hear, hear the, the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, kind of like summer being nigh, like the fig tree, when ye shall see these things, what things? The things he's just talked about. Know that it is near, even to the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. The keys to understanding that little parable he gave was understanding that when they saw figs or when they saw the leaves on the fig tree, they knew something. 
When you see the leaves, that means fruit's coming. When you have fruit on the fig tree, that means summer's coming. That means harvest time's coming. Every time Matthew in his gospel uses the phrase summer, or he's talking about the harvest time, there's always a harvest. When he's talking about the harvest time, it's always the harvest of men's souls. It's always the harvest that's going to come from God, whether gathering them for reward or gathering them for uh, eternal judgment. So he says, now here's what's going to happen. When, it's like the fig tree. When you see it start to come, guess what? It's, it's, it's harvest time. He's talking about when now, remember? He's moved from what to when. So he's giving them a general idea. He says, then when you see these things, all those things that I listed for you, for when I see those signals from verse 4, that it's going to be likewise. It's going to be just like that. He says, now once those happen... It's near. What is it? What do you mean, it's near? Well, Luke, thank God, the best commentary of the Bible is the Bible. In Luke chapter 21, verse 31, Luke writes, So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Here's the answer. When's it going to happen? When you see these things come to pass, when you begin to realize it's like the fig tree, it's starting to blossom, here comes judgment, payday someday. The harvest is fixing to come. Then you will know the kingdom of God is near. He's, then he adds this phrase, and this generation. And we went through at great length to finally figure out what generation he's talking about. Was it that generation that's living right then? Or was he in reference to the generation who sees these things come about? It's that generation. It's that last generation, and this generation, the generation that sees the abomination of desolation, the generation that goes through the earthquakes, the generation who misses the rapture. By the way, it could be this generation. If the rapture takes place tonight, guess what? This generation of people, these unbelievers that are going to be left behind, they will see the end. Some of them won't because they will die and they will be prepared to, to go into ever eternal punishment. But those who make it through, he says, they will see it through till they see me coming again. And when they see me coming again, what's going to happen? He says, then the angel comes through and they gather together and he comes through for eternal judgment. And he makes mention of that in just a second. Then he gives them, based on my authority, based on the fact that the world that you live in, you think it's going to last forever unless you're AOC, and then you think you got 12 more years out of it. However, you're gonna blow, this is going to blow your mind. I agree with her. Within 12 years, we could have a climate crisis. If the rapture takes place tonight, they're going to have, within seven years, a massive climate crisis. The tides are going to rise. Salt water is going to be corrupted. Fresh water is going to be corrupted. Stars are going to fall from the heaven. The moon's not going to shine. The sun's going to start darkening out. All because of climate change. You better believe it. And climate change is because of what? All things are made by him and for him and consist by him. As I pointed out the other day, JT loves it. He's got the whole world in his hands. And so, yeah, it could all happen within 12 years. Sure could. But that's kind of date said. And so what Jesus says is that generation that happens, the generation that's there when the rapture takes place and they're left behind, that generation will go through and they'll go through to the end. They'll, they, will, they will see the end of time. They will see the sign of me coming. And he said, now, you understand this earth's going to pass away. But my word, it won't. So... If you think the rock of Gibraltar is strong, why do you listen to the words that come out of the mouth of the true rock of God? These words will not change. These words will not alter. This will happen because Jesus said so. Now, then he goes to the verse 36 that we've read to you tonight. He says, okay, let's look at this wind thing. Okay, what, is, what does verse number 36 say? But of that day and hour... Knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. He has given a lot of questions, and he specifically is going to deal with it right now. He gave a general idea of the time, didn't he? 
He taught us about the, the period of time, the era of time, what's going to be going through. And then he answers the question of, well, when's this going to take place? They wanted him to be what? Very specific. Well, he is very specific as much as he knows. What? <laughs> Listen now. This is where, again, we've, we've shattered it a little bit. We've talked about it some. We'll finish talking about it a little bit more tonight. He says that the day and the hour, no man will know. Now, you'll know the signals. You'll know, well, okay, there's a lot of people missing who used to say they were Christians. They're gone. Israel signed a peace treaty with the fella, and everything's going okay for them first three and a half years. It's okay, it seems. Now he set up a statue in the Holy of Holies, and he says he's God, and you better worship him. Now people are crying for the mountains to fall on them, and people are running to the hills and, and uh, got to have the mark of the beast, and not, all this is now happening. He said, yeah, you'll know. It's getting close, isn't it? He said, now you know it is drawing nigh, but you want to know the day, and you want to know the hour, and you can't. Why not? God doesn't want you to. God does not want us to. We have wanted to know that for a long time. In verse number 42, he's going to say, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 44 of this chapter, he's going to say, Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. In verse number 50, he says, In such an hour, in such a day, and in and such an hour. In Matthew chapter 25, he keeps going on in verse number 13. He'll say, that day nor the hour. Notice what Jesus is saying. He's not saying you won't know the events. He's not saying you won't know the season of life. He's not saying you won't know about when it's going to happen. He's saying you will not know the hour. You will not know the exact day that I'm coming back. God's not going to reveal that to you. You're not going to know it, and so that's just the way it works. You're not going to know it. Well, why not? God didn't want you to know it. He gave you the general idea, but God wants us to be ready. Not only does He want us to be ready, He wants us to be expecting it. You see, if you knew what day it is, and if it's three weeks from now, you wouldn't be expecting it tomorrow. So you would live differently now than you would the night before. That's the way men are. So men don't know. He goes on to point out something out. But that day it will not be known at all by any man. And then he goes a step further and points out, nor the angels. The angels in heaven who are the ministering saints of God, they're not going to know exactly when. They don't know even though they're going to be the instruments of some of God's judgment on the earth. Remember all the book of Revelation? And this angel did that, and this angel opened this, and this angel did, and this angel. They're going to be very active in the, at when the coming of the Son of Man. They're going to be very active in Jesus' second coming. But right now, they don't know, and they don't have a clue. Now, if you remember the days we were looking at way back a couple of weeks ago where it says, well... It should then happen, if you count, 1,260 days, right? Well, no, because now Daniel threw another 30 days into that mix, didn't he? And then after that, Revelation threw another 45 or 40 days into that. So now you got like 75 or 45 days. So now you got like 75 days that are floating around between the establishment of the kingdom and the judgment of the nations that takes place. So you might know about when, <laughs> as the old preacher used to say, Give or take a day and an hour. <laughs> I love Vance Havner. If you ever get a chance to read anything that guy wrote or listen to any of his old sermons, he was great. And that, that's, that's, that was one of his great sayings. He said, I know exactly when Jesus is coming. Give or take a day and an hour. We don't have a clue. We don't know. And so when he says that he's coming immediately, and he does use that word, immediately to God, does not mean immediately as it does to us. Remember, we shared with you a few weeks ago over in Peter when it says the Lord's not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. God keeps his promises. But on that same verse of Scripture, he said, 
a day to the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. God doesn't run by calendar. Do you ever, did you ever realize God invented time and space? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There's, time, there's space. And the evening and the morning were the first day. He just created time. God did that. God, time does, and space does not contain God. God contains time and space. He holds them in his hand. He he's, controls everything. So when he says no man's going to know the hour, that means there's not going to be any natural man, no human being, who's going to know that. Then he goes on to say, even the angels will not know that, as I pointed that out to you. And then in this particular portion of Scripture in Matthew, he used that phrase, know only the Father. The Father only will know. But wait a minute. Again, the best commentary of the Bible is the Bible. Mark chapter 13 says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Over in the, another portion of Scripture, you know what else he says? Nor the Son of Man. That's him. Wait a minute. How can Jesus, who's God, not know something? <laughs> he didn't know. You know how I know he didn't know? Because I believe it's in Matthew chapter 15, he's teaching the disciples about his relationship to the Father. And he says, I know all that the Father has taught me. And I'm his servant, and I've humbled myself to him, and you are my servants. And I have taught you, you ready for this? I have taught you all that the Father hath given me. So everything that Jesus knew on the face of this earth, he's already taught the disciples. And what did he say? No man knows. Not the angels nor the Son of Man, only the Father. Remember when I pointed out to you about the incarnation of Christ? In what the Bible calls, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he humbled himself and became the form of a man in the book of Philippians. Well, part of that humbling be, became not using or limiting his ability to use some of his godly characteristics some of his godly traits. One of them was full wisdom access. Remember, the Bible says he grew in stature and in wisdom with man and God. And notice now what's, what's real interesting is after Jesus dies on the cross and after his resurrection and when he gets ready to go back into heaven, listen to what he says in the book of Acts. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, <laughs> wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? This is the same question they just had a couple months earlier. We are in that couple of months earlier question. And now he's died, he's, res he's resurrected, and he's fixing to ascend. It's been 40 days. And he said unto them, watch this, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Where's the power of the knowledge of the kingdom coming from? Are you coming in the kingdom? It's not for you to know. It's in the power of the Father. Okay, you got that? Okay. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and Judea. So he says, you can't know it because you don't have the power of the Father with you. Now listen, same text, same event. Matthew's recording, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, this is right there, when they just asked that question, and he said this to them. This is Matthew's record of it. And Matthew says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So after his resurrection, and as he's getting ready to ascend into heaven, what does Jesus say? The knowledge of the day and hour is in the power of of God the Father. You don't have that power because it's not for you to know. And then he said, all power has been given to me. So after the resurrection, does Jesus know when he's coming again? Does he know the day and hour now? You know why? The prayer was answered from the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Lord, restore unto me the glory that we shared before the foundation of the world. 
So did God do that? Yes. So did Jesus now become the omnipotent God, removed all flesh from him? Yes, he did. And so at that time, he now addresses it, no, the Father knows, but guess what the Father did? Father gave me all power. So everything the Father knows, the Son knows, and guess what he just shared? Something else. And we're going to give you a limited amount of that power through the Holy Spirit of God. And you know what that limited amount of power is going to be? You're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Not to know when the hour is. Not to know the date that I'm coming back. But here's what I want you to do with this almighty power of God that's going to indwell you. God is going to live in you. And here's the power. Here's what I want you to do with that power. Don't try to figure out the day and the hour. Instead, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. What did Matthew say? Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. What is he saying? The power is not to sit back and use the God-given wisdom God's given you to figure out when he's coming, but to hurry up and get out there and tell somebody he's coming, and so they can come to know the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's what the power is all about. It's not for intellectualism. It's not for our knowing. It's not so we can be smarter than any other denomination. It's not so we, it's so we can go and tell the gospel message and watch people get saved. And after they get saved, we baptize them. And then after we baptize them, we teach them the word of God till the Lord Jesus comes again. That's where all the power is laying. So that's what he's trying to get across to these guys. You're going to be getting some power. I'm going to leave some power. But the power is not for that. So what did the first century church begin to do then? Instead of worrying what day and hour, the early church started anticipating the day and hour. That's the difference between the church 2,000 years ago and the church today. Today, Christian bookstores are filled with When's the rapture? I've got it figured out. It's this day. It's this time. It's this great prophet of God is on the TV, and here's when the Lord's coming, and I've got a vision from God, and God's told me this. God, listen, you're missing the boat. That's not what God wanted. He told them disciples point blank. You're not to know, but I'm going to give you some power. So instead of trying to figure out the day and the hour, look what the church of Corinth did. Paul says, so that you can come waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What were they doing? They were sharing the gospel while they were waiting on the coming of the Son of God. What was the church of, of uh, the uh, Philippians doing? He says in Philippians chapter 3, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Church of Philippi, what are you doing? We're sharing the gospel with people. What are you telling them? He's coming back. They say when. They go, we don't care, but you better be ready. It could be tomorrow. It's imminent. He's coming back. What did Paul write in the book of Hebrews to the Hebrews scattered around? He says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What were they doing? They were looking forward to the coming of Jesus. The early church believed Jesus was going to come in their day and time. In the book of James, James says, Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near. Peter said, The end of all things is at hand. First John says, In these last days. John wrote in the book of Revelation, Behold, I come quickly, Jesus said. And he said, Even so come, Lord Jesus. You see, the focus was not on a date. The focus was on an event. We want to see Jesus. We need to be with Jesus. So what do we do? We live in expectancy. We expect Him to come at any moment, at any time. We believe that. And then we have a lot of these people today <laughs> that Peter told us was going to come that were going to be scoffing at it. Well, then why is he waiting? Why is he waiting? Well, I think we, when we read Revelation chapter 14 uh, a few weeks ago, it answered that question. That angel came down to the, and said to the one sitting on the cloud, cloud, thrust in your sickle, for the earth is ripe for harvest. 
Remember, he says that he's waiting his return because he's waiting for the mystery of iniquity to be revealed. That means for sin to run its course, for sin to get all the sin it can, get it out of its system. I got to looking at that word again this past week, and it has really, really rattled my soul. The mystery of iniquity to be revealed. One of the reasons Jesus has not returned yet is he's waiting for some sin that we have not even contemplated yet to show up on the earth. Can, I can't even fathom what it would be. The mystery of iniquity. The unknown sin. The sin that has yet to be revealed to mankind. Just think of the sins that we've seen in our last few years that we would have never thought of happening before. Roe versus Wade makes abortion, quote-unquote, legal in this country. We never thought we'd hit that. And then all of a sudden it became not just legal, it became legitimate. Abortion became birth control. And, and we started fighting and going, wait a minute, you, you can't take all these babies' lives. And then it's become to where today you can do the test because science has gotten further, and you can do a test on the baby and, and find out if it's sex, and now they're even allowing the idea to come and it's being done in some other countries, not this one yet that we know of. But if it's not the sex you wanted, you can terminate it. Now, who would have thought of that? We've all put ourselves in that question box before, haven't we? What would you do if? That what if box? What if you this? What, what if your mom? What if your wife? What if your daughter got raped? Would you? What if the doctor said it's going to be the mom or the baby? What if? Would you? See, we've gone beyond those kind of sin choices. Now it's the abortion didn't work, the baby's alive, set it to the side and let it die. Who would have thought this country and this world would have ever come to that? That's a mystery of iniquity, wasn't it? That's something just 10 years ago with rampant abortion running through our country, no one thought, well, after the birth of the baby, we'll set it aside and just let it die. We would have, we would have never thought of that. But look at what we see. Wickedness is going to abound just before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God's waiting for sin to run its course for the mystery of iniquity to be revealed. I, I, I cannot even fathom. It shudders me to think of my poor grandbabies, the world they're growing up in right now, that sins that you and I would have never even thought humanly possible to do will be being committed on a regular basis. But you see, there's another reason he waits. In that portion of Peter that I shared with you the, uh, earlier, about the scoffers coming in the last days. He says that God's not slack concerning his promises, men count slackness. He goes on to say uh, just above that, that a thousand years, that, that whole section. And after he says, God's not slack concerning his promises, men count slackness, God keeps his word. Jesus said, I'm coming again. Jesus said, here's what's going to take place. And then the next statement after that, he makes the, because God's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Lord, why have you waited for sin to run its course and for salvation to be offered? For salvation to be offered. The reason he waits is because of sin, and the reason he waits is because of salvation. And now back over in verse 36, they say, well, when? And he says, you're not going to know. Well, if I'm not going to know, what should that do to us? If, if I'm not going to know when he's coming, 
how am I going to live my life right now? Well, the early church lived it in expectancy, looking that Jesus was going to come at any moment, looking that Jesus could come today. They were looking at those things. But, but what about us? And so it's amazing that Jesus uses this illustration about the second coming, and Peter also uses this illustration later when he writes. I guess Peter took good notes, amen? Notice what Jesus says in verse number 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They weren't expecting it. They had all the warnings. They had what we know uh, from the Bible, 120 years of preaching, that Noah was a righteous preacher. See, most of us think Noah was nothing but a boat builder. Noah preached before he built boats. Noah preached while he built boats. And Noah preached after he built boats. Noah was a preacher. And so he was a preacher of righteousness. And so God says, you know what? This, they're not expecting it, and they need to be alert. And so for the next statements, the next couple of parables and the next couple of statements, Jesus gave us a, a, an attitude adjustment. Here's how, <coughs> excuse me, here's how your attitude should be. You should be alert to it. You should have a readiness to it, and you should be faithful in it. And so for the next, <coughs> excuse me, for the next couple of weeks, that's what we're going to look at. And the first thing we're going to look at real quick like is the alertness of it. He says it's going to be like Noah's days. And what were the days of Noah like? <laughs> oh, boy, were they something else? Doesn't the Bible describe those days as men were doing evil in their minds? What? Continually. Well, guess what? After the rapture, what do you think men are going to be doing? For the next seven years, men are going to be doing evil continually. During that time frame, guess what's going to happen? That's when that mystery sin is going to be revealed because he says he's going to come after that. So unless it's revealed tonight and then the rapture takes place, it's going to be revealed soon. It's going to come. And so as he says in the days of Noah, you know, in the days of Noah, they didn't really care, did they? Noah was preaching. Noah was building. Noah was giving warning. You say, well, and we're doing that too. And, but these poor guys, they're only going to get seven years of warning. Listen, they've had 2,000 years of warning. Men have had over 2,000 years of warning. You've got to remember too, in Noah's day, 120 years? Wasn't a real long time because them dudes were living seven, 800 years. So remember as he's going to use this illustration, he uses that same illustration that Peter will later use and bring up again about Noah and what's going to happen. You know what happened? They're going to ignore the warning signs. They're not going to look for it. How, how, did, how did the people of God or how did the people of the earth act when Noah was preaching? How has mankind, how did Israel after the flood, how has men always done? We ignore God's word. We ignore God's miracles. We ignore God's prophets. And in the eyes of the world, they killed God's son. They, they really don't. It's not the fact that they don't know. They don't care to know. They don't want to know. It's not of any interest to them. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, just right now, watching what's going on in our world right now, tuck away in your mind rapture tomorrow. Think of, or, or rapture tonight would be even better. But think about that phrase. Keep that locked in your mind as you're watching everything going on right now. How's this world going to react to the next pandemic called the rapture? You, you do understand Biden will put a commission together. I'm very confident of that. You say, what do you mean? I have a strange reason his view of Jesus and my view of Jesus are not the same. In fact, even a couple of Catholic priests believe the same. He don't even believe like they believe. So, so they're going to put a committee together. They're going to they're have to figure this thing out. They're going to look socially at what's happening. 
in the world. Why is everybody fighting so much now? Why is this group of people able to get this kind of peace treaty with this group of people, and, and over here this is war is going on? Why is it the economy's gone nuts? Why is the moon getting darker and darker? Science has got to have the answer. Science don't even have all the questions, amen? You do remember they used to say the earth was flat, right? You know what? I'm going to jump ahead of myself to, uh, to, to share something with you. God just proved in this statement, Jesus just proved in this statement, the earth is a sphere. He, he proves it point blank. Watch how he proves it. He uses uh, an analogy about some people being taken away. Remember that? In just a minute, he's going to say they're going to be taken away. And when he begins to say they're going to be taken away, he says that in verse 40, two will be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding in the mill, one taken, the other left. Now, over in Luke, he adds another illustration. Two shall be sleeping. One shall be taking the other left. Well, wait a minute. What, what did that prove, Brother Rick? Unless you're in America, <laughs> the people who are at work on one side of the earth and people were asleep on the other side. Why is that? Because the earth is round. It's rotating on its axis. As it orbits the sun and the moon goes, and what do we have? We have day and we have night. Why do we have day and night? It's not, you can't have day and night on flat, right? You're still going to have on the circle of the earth. He, he makes that statement clear already, right here. So science don't know everything that they think they know. But by the way, the Bible does. And so as he's pointing this thing out to them that, these people are going to come, but they didn't know it. They didn't care to know it. They were going through the average, everyday events of life. They were eating, they were drinking. Listen, he said they were doing everything imaginable in their mind for evil continually. But you know what else they had to do? They had to have a hamburger every now and then. You had to stop sinning long enough to feed the kids something to eat dinner tonight. They were eating, they were drinking. They were doing social things. They were being married. They were giving in marriage. Being married is the, the couple. Giving in marriage is the family was involved in the social side. Everything was, society was going as normal, even though in the midst of it, they were hearing about a warning from God, and they were rejecting that warning. They were scoffing that warning. They were laughing at that warning, and they did that until when? The waters washed them away. The flood came. And they knew not, he said. Until, and he used the word cataclysm, which means a catastrophe came, and it washed them all away. It swept them away. They were gone. It was over. You know, and that verse that I just read to you, I'll point it out to you in verse number 40. He says that the one will be taken, the other left. Two women, one will be taken, the other left. You got a lot of preachers who preach that wrong right there. You say, why? Well, that's the rapture, isn't it? Can't be. The rapture takes place before he ever starts talking in chapter 24. Well, that's the way it's going to work in the rapture, isn't it? Oh, then that's just a, a biblical principle of the rapture. No, it's not. What's he say? What did he say it was going to be near? The kingdom of God. His coming again. When he comes again, one's going to be taken and one's going to be left behind. You see, in the rapture, you want to be taken. You don't want to be left behind. In the second coming, you don't want to be taken. You want to be left behind. You say, what do you mean? What did that angel tell him? Thrust the sickle. When Jesus comes... And it says that he gathers them from the four corners of the earth. What happens? One will be taken, the other left behind. One will be taken in judgment to eternal fire. 
The other will be left behind. For what? The establishment of the, holy, the heavenly kingdom. The establishment of the millennial kingdom. Those are the people who made it through the tribulation, who knew the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, who will populate the thousand-year millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. You see, when he's talking about here, want to be taken, want to be left, that's not the rapture. The rapture is not even a part of the conversation in Matthew 24 and 25. They asked, what's the sign of your coming? Jesus said, okay, here it is. He never discussed the rapture with them. There's, no, it's already happened. You are wanting to know after the rapture, here's what's going to happen. And when he comes again, there's going to be a separation time again. By the way, the Lord knows how to separate. He knows how to separate the wheat from the tares. He knows how to separate the, the sheep from the goats. The Lord knows exactly how and when and why to separate. And so as he tells them that, he then tells them, here's what I want you to do. And here's where I got the idea of here's what our attitude should be. Watch, therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Watch based on everything I've said to this point. You know the truth. You know what's going to happen. You know how it's going to happen. You know where it's going to happen. You just don't know exactly the specific day and hour. Based on that and knowing that when I do come back, there's going to be a separation. Some will be taken to judgment. Some will be left for blessing and reward. What should you then be doing who hear this today? Watch. It means be alert. Be aware of. Be conscious of. Be thinking about it. Because, why? For ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. You don't know when. So what am I supposed to do? Expect it. Any time, any day, any hour, Jesus could come. Now, isn't that interesting that his second coming is put up in two parts? So that message, that phrase, will work for the rapture. Watch. Be ready. You don't know when the trumpet's going to sound. The apostle Paul thought it was going to be in his day. Isn't that what he told the church of Thessalonica? And we shall not prevent them which are asleep? No. What's going to happen? The trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we, that dude's been dead almost 2,000 years. <laughs> we, we which are alive and remain. You see, Paul wasn't dead when he wrote that. And you know what Paul thought? Jesus is coming in my lifetime. Folks, let me tell you something. Jesus could come in our lifetimes. So what do we do? Watch. Be alert. Be filled with the power. And go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And by the way, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. You can't, you can't shake Jesus, amen? And by the way, he doesn't want you to. Let's stand for prayer.